All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alec. Um, thank you to Joyce and, and Laura. And thank you to each and every one of you for being here today. Um, I'm really very grateful for your presence. I know we've been and could continue to be through a difficult time. So having you here in person today means a lot to me. And especially, I'm very grateful to you, Janice, um, for being here today. I'm inspired every day by everything you have done and by all your amazing contributions um, in research, in contributing toward making computing a more diverse field, um, for all your accomplishments, for being such a strong advocate for, for women. Um, and I'm really happy to have you and your family here today. Um, so, so thank you for that. I was asked to talk today about my research and what matters to me. And I did spend some time thinking about what I should be talking about. Obviously, natural language processing is my field of research. It's been for the past 20 plus years, and I absolutely love it. I love languages. I love computing. I love everything about natural language processing. Um, that's really the thing that makes me excited in the morning, thinking about all these interesting problems and the impact it can, it can have. On the other side, I'm also really passionate about people. Um, I really see how they make a difference every day, including you here today, um, my students, my collaborators, um, all the wonderful staff that put together this event here, um, of course, my family and friends. And so it's really, they are not two separate things. So natural language processing and people, I think they really belong together. So what I want to talk about today is about this interplay between natural language processing and people how natural language processing can actually have impact on society, how people need to be at the center of the research that we do in this field for it to be equitable, and how it really matters who's doing this research. And so um, that's really the main message that I want to send across today, that research, particularly talking about natural language processing, but other research too, and people cannot really be detached from one another. So specifically looking at this field of natural language processing, um, we've been working on this for 60 plus years. And the past few years have seen a lot of advances. So now we know a lot of things. If we take one individual word, say the word sun, we know how to create representations. You might have heard about all these advances in neural networks, all these GPT-2, GPT-3, trained on billions and billions of words that created fancy representations and eventually allow us to compute with words. The same would go for phrases. If we take a phrase like with paper, we know how to computationally identify the relation between the words and know what's a verb, what's a noun, what's the relation between them, and on and on going to larger units of text, entire sentences, how to represent them, entire paragraphs and documents. So this is really what we generally do in natural language processing. We really focus on words. Now, who's behind these words? They are people. So people are those that eventually create language. People are those who benefit from the technologies that we are producing in natural language processing and beyond. And people are really those who are working on the research in this space. So really, there is a very close connection going both ways, from language to people and from people to natural language processing. So I want to take one component at a time and illustrate with some of my thoughts or things that I've been um, trying to contribute to work. So first off, thinking about natural language processing and what is that these technologies are, are trying to, to achieve. There is a lot of very exciting research and a lot of basic research, and we are all for that. Laura Burdi, for instance, did her PhD around word representation, which is really a fundamental problem. But we are also motivated, as she said, we are motivated by what is the societal impact of the work that we do. So in my lab, a lot of the work that we are doing has this as a goal. We have that front and center, thinking about what is the kind of societal impact that we have. So these are just some examples of work that we do. For instance, we work on understanding what are different the differences between cultures in terms of behaviors, beliefs, value, 
through a computational lens, how can we identify misinformation, which is something that we are running against every day, including now, thinking about misinformation about COVID or vaccine and so forth. Um, how can we really understand learners, people, students, more than just by looking at their grades? What are the things that really make them tick? And there is a lot that we can glean through language. How can we understand how mental health is, is onset and what are the things that we could do to, I realize when mental health issues may, may occur and what are the things that we could do to help. And it turns out that there is a lot that we see um, in language. There are also projects in, in my lab that accompany natural language with other modalities, for instance, vision or physiological processing. Um, and there are a series of projects where we are really interested in understanding more about behavior and human behavior when it comes to deception, the example the Joyce gave, when it comes to discomfort, stress, emotion, and so on. We also care about the application with have to do with detecting activities or being able to answer questions in real settings. Imagine, for instance, something like Alexa or Siri that would be able to tell you things that might be important to you, such as where did I leave my keys, or did, my, or did I take my medicine, and so forth. So having that ability to actually provide support in daily life. And we also work on conversational technologies. Here, a lot of the work that we do is in collaboration with uh, researchers from Michigan Medicine, from School of Public Health, so they are around healthcare. It's really core natural language processing in terms of conversations, understanding conversations, and facilitating conversations, whether it's about collecting medical family history, about providing counseling, um, or support in settings such as um, the pandemic. So I want to zoom in on a couple of projects, um, which are some of the recent projects that we've been working on and illustrate some of the impact that the kind of research that um, our lab has been focusing on can, can have. So when we look at all the things that happen around us, um, we see oftentimes public health issues. Um, the stress and anxiety that people have experienced for the past two years is just one. Um, there is also substance abuse, uh, where more than 20 million Americans, so only focusing on US, um, need some kind of substance abuse treatment. Um, there are other health issues. Uh, there are people who want to stop smoking, losing weight, and so forth. Um, and for those health issues, behavioral interventions are considered to be very helpful. They can actually encourage people to pursue through those, um, those health treatments. It turns out that although millions of people are in need of such um, behavioral interventions, there is a shortage of counselors, one. And second, the counselors that we have need to get through periodical training. They need to do a lot of self-reflection to realize what is it really works and what works for us. And so in our collaborations with uh, School of Public Health and Michigan Medicine, for several years, we've been working on natural language processing technologies for counseling conversations, looking primarily at two aspects. One aspect is to go deep in the conversations and understand what are the behavior that counselors have. Are they asking a question? Are they making a reflection? If they are making a reflection, what kind of reflection? Is that something that's triggering the patient to speak more, to maybe decide that they want to change, which is really what these behavioral interventions aim to achieve. And so rather than having a human being to go through those uh, conversations, which is really currently what's happening, and giving feedback that way, we are able, through our technology, to provide that feedback that could happen on a daily basis. So you have a counseling intervention and a system based on natural language processing could provide you with that kind of feedback, could tell you you asked this many questions, you made this many reflections. Successful counselors for this particular behavior 
would typically do this and that. So really providing counselors with the kind of training that would get them to be better counselors. So this is not to replace counselors. This is really just to bring the wisdom of thousands of counselors at the fingertips of every single counselor. So they themselves can get better. The other angle that we looked at is how we can, again, assist counselors in what would work best to say. So as, again, not replacing counselors, but really just helping them with language that might be useful for a certain setting. So for instance, assuming somebody who's trying to lose weight and they receive counseling, they may say something along the lines of, I had a really hard time sticking to my diet this week. And so the question is, what should a good counselor say? And what we've been doing in recent work is looking at how can we bring in medical knowledge, how can we bring in semantically related information, and like I said, the wisdom from other counselors. So what other counselors have said in similar situations so that we can actually generate a reflection, generate something that's empathetic and would possibly help this patient to stick to their diet. So it might come something like, you are wondering whether you'll be able to adhere to your diet which what will, this will do will encourage them to say more. Why is that an issue and, and so on. And what we found is that this is comparable to what people are doing in terms of quality of the output and in terms of how empathetic this output is perceived, which is really what counselors are, um, are trying to do. Now, building upon this work, uh, when the pandemic hit, we realized, again, in collaboration with psychologists, that stress and anxiety was one big thing. It hit every single one of us, just wondering about what, what tomorrow will bring. And so we said that we could perhaps help people think through these issues and building upon theories and practical examples from psychology and also really simplifying the work that we've been doing that I talked about earlier, we created this online you could call it chatbot. It's not really a chatbot. It's nothing like Siri or Alexa. You cannot really have open conversations. It's more like an interview. It's a system that tries to really get you to think through the issues that you might have. So it's really the system is not really helping you in any ways, just helping in the sense of getting people to think about what is that's causing distress? What is that's causing anxiety? And just it's people themselves who help themselves because there is a system that just give some prompts at the right time. So all, that's all it does. It's not necessarily super sophisticated technology, but it's knowing when to ask uh, and what kind of questions. Similarly, when we've been having the uh, Black Lives Matter, um, all the challenges that we've been facing, it turns out that people are sometimes not really open to talk about the issues they would have, whether they are open or not to talk with others, whether they are open or not to meet with people of a uh, different racial identity. So we created a similar intervention, which builds upon the kind of dialogue system that we have, but again, simplified the sense of it's system driven. It's like an interview. And it's really to get the people to think about what is that's going on? What are they thinking about the other race? Would they like to meet with others? and really getting people to internalize this. Um, and what we found is that this system, although it's, again, it's a simplified version of all the advanced technology we have, it can make a difference uh, for people in terms of um, removing stress, which is the metric that we look for uh, when we build a system um, around relieving stress during the COVID pandemic. And one user, it's of course a cherry picked quote, uh, but one user did indicate that I just completed the interview and might say I really enjoyed it and loved the analysis afterwards. It actually made me feel better about myself, which is really the goal that we have, is give prompts at the right time to get people to feel better about themselves. Now, here is another project that I want to briefly talk about, uh, which is how to understand people's values um, across cultures. A lot of the work, including work that we do in my lab, focuses on English, and a lot of the work focuses on a, just a, a handful of cultures. So a question that we ask, again, in collaboration with psychologists, is whether we can use language to understand the values that are driving people. And so we ask people just to tell us about their values in natural language, and they came up with things such as just to be at peace with myself and others, 
or being honest and straightforward is the most important values in life. So now from here, we wanted to distill what are the set of values. We didn't want to work with thousands of these value expressions, which are all wonderful to read, but we cannot really process them and distill them. So we use um, topic modeling, which is a process that we often use in, in NLP. Uh, and with that, we're able to come up with a few values that seem to be what's driving people. Among others, people talked about respect for others, about religion, about family, hard work, time and money, problem solving, and so on. Now, the next question is, are these values really the same across cultures? So are they, people say, from the United States and India driven in the same way? So for that, what we did, uh, we once again collected these um, statements from people from all, like these two countries. Um, and then we wanted to see to what extent the topics and the values that we identify were distributed across the two countries. Um, now, we ran into a challenge here it's because aside from the culture itself, so we knew the location, this is all data collected through crowdsourcing, we knew the location, but then there was also gender, which maybe wasn't uniformly distributed among the people who contributed data, um, and age. So we used topic modeling coupled with some disentanglement to figure out what are the different aspects that actually matter in these values. And it turned out that those values that we found previously, for instance, respect for others, or religion, or family, they are indeed distributed differently across cultures or genders. Um, and this all is done computationally. So we start with the language, and then we build bottom up using this, um, these technologies. So in this example, just to illustrate, um, maybe it's harder to read because you have to look left and right. So for instance, for the, the red columns, left would be US, right would be India. So we see that people in US would really value hard work, so that's a top value for them. Um, whereas people in India would really value problem solving. And that's just one example from things that we can uncover by, by analyzing language. I'll give our example that's maybe a little closer to home, um, which is this faculty reviews. So there is Ray, my professor, of course, we also have internal reviews. Ray, my professor, happens to have data that is public. So there are all these comments that students would submit um, in response to the classes they take. Um, and while there is some rubric that they would fill in with numbers, what we really care about was language. And also what we care about was to understand what is the student's life in a professor with the hypothesis that maybe not every single student likes the same thing. Like say, for instance, computer science students may appreciate a certain um, characteristic of a faculty, maybe somebody in arts, something else, uh, maybe somebody in psychology, something else, and so forth. So we apply the same idea that I described earlier, where we start with really the student comments, we build topics, we disentangle them, because we want to know what is the discipline that these students are from. We also threw in red to see if red matters for the university um, and country. We had these comments from Canada and US. And all in all, we had close to one million comments from students in this natural language format. So from here, we came up with several traits, um, which at least students in the room will probably recognize, I guess faculty in the room as well. So students really talk about approachability, so that's something that matters. Clarity, course logistics, enthusiasm, what are expectations, how helpful faculty are, whether they are humorous, interesting, what are reading discussion, and what is the study material. So these are sort of the main themes that students would talk about when talking about their, their professors. Now the question is, are all students talking the same? And what we found is that really not the case. So again, a little harder to read, but I'll help you through. Um, so green columns represent country. To the left, we have US. To the right, we have Canada. Then red would be the light green. I won't pay too much attention to that. We didn't really find any distinctions with respect to red. Um, and then the other colors are disciplines. So for instance, when it comes to course logistics, American students really care about that. So they will often talk about course logistics. They want to know what's expected from them, where they are coming from, where they are going. So that's, that's one thing. 
uh, that will then go for reading discussions. And just to go through with the country, so the green one, students in Canada would really appreciate approachability and humor. So when they comment about their professors, that's one of the emphasis that you'll see among Canadian students. Now, when it comes to other disciplines, um, we see, for instance, in biological science, that will be the, the light blue. So biological sciences care about clarity, but do not really care too much about humor. Um, they also care about approachability. We see, for instance, physics also care about clarity. Um, and we see some others. So if we go back here, we see, for instance, physics or arts, fine arts, will not care too much about study material. Um, and there are other things that will matter for art students. So this is just one way to dive in data, language data, which we see around in so many different forms, whether it's student comments, conversations that counselors have, misinformation is out there in the form of news, and so much more. So natural language processing is really giving a way to process these data, and then in turn also have made a difference in, um, in society through the kind of technology that we can get. Now, in general, when we talk about natural language processing, we assume that we can build one technology and that will do it for that particular problem that we we work on. As it turns out, that's really not the case. Um, and there was a conversation that I had relatively recently uh, with the, um, a data science group in Detroit. And they ran into a problem. With the pandemic, there was a lot of homeschooling. Families were given devices, as it happened to, with my children as well. And then they were supposed to just use them. And as it turns out, a lot of these families didn't know a lot of things, like how you, I don't know, how you get this particular application on this device, how, what to do if you start connecting to the internet, how to take a test, and so on and so forth. So this center in Detroit was taking all these questions from families about technology, and it turned out a lot of them were repeating. So they could see use in using a question answering system, so something that would have maybe a list of questions and answers, a little bit of intelligence on top, and we'll be able to handle that, like getting a question, understanding what is the goal of that question, looking to all the information technology information they had, and provide an answer. And in question answering, we claim, at least in natural language processing, that we made a lot of advances, and we are pretty proud. Turned out, it didn't work for them. It didn't work for this large community in Detroit. And why it didn't work? It's because this technology was built for English. And in Detroit, most families were speaking, they would refer to it as the Detroit slang. So it was the language they used on a daily basis. It's just that this technology completely failed to understand them. So it was just giving failure after failure to the point that it wasn't really usable. So really what we are saying in the research that we do in, in my lab is that one size does not fit all when we build these technologies it applies to natural language processing, but to other areas as well. And so I want to step back a little bit. Um, we really started from the basics. So one of the basic units in natural language processing is word association. So with word association, I give you a prompt, and you have to tell me something in return. Okay, so we'll do just a little exercise. So if I say cat, what is that you would say? First thing that comes to mind. No overthinking. <laughs> Dog. So I see a lot of dog, which is really typical. So we see cat and dog. Now, how about if I say sleep? What is the first thing that comes to mind? Yes. Night. Night. <laughs> Awake. Dream. So it turns out that for some prompts, we kind of agree, but for others, we do not. And this is exactly what Two psychologists about 100 years ago did. They took 100 prompts and asked people exactly what I asked here. What is the first word that comes to mind? And it turns out that there is variation of these word associations with age and also gender. So for instance, for sleep, the younger group dominant answer was dream, whereas for a less young group, the dominant answer was awake. Mm -hmm. 
If we take food as a prompt, we'll see dominant answer for the young group, eating, less young, drinking. <laughs> so what we've done, we said, well, we want to see to what extent we can replicate this, and also to what extent we can build natural language processing representation that will be closer to really the, the group of people that has these responses. And so we took 300 words, starting with those 100 that Ken and Rosano had, plus 200 others. We did crowdsourcing. We asked people from India and US to tell us what is the first word that comes to mind. And we had some spam checking questions um, and also uh, demographic questions. All in all, we collected more than 200 responses, um, and which we then balanced across gender and culture. So here is an example. Prompt back. Just think for yourself, what is the first word that comes to mind? So when we look at male respondents from US, the dominant response was water. When we look at male respondents from India, dominant response was water. When we look at female respondents from India, dominant response was so. And then female respondents from US, dominant response was bubble. <laughs> and there are a few other such examples. For instance, for inspect, dominant response for male respondents. <laughs> female was baby. Or if we look at location, admit in India, dominant response would be hospital, in US would be yeah. <laughs> So what this really tells us is that there are differences between how people think about the world, how they perceive the world. And we did some analysis of all these responses that we collected. We found that indeed, people would agree more with other people from their same group. So if we take one respondent out, and compare their response with people from the same group, whether it's the same gender or the same culture, we see that they agree more than would be with people from the other, from the other group. So that's confirming this hypothesis, which was really formulated many years back in, in psychology, that there are differences between groups of people. And then the other thing that we wanted to do is to see to what extent we can build models that would more closely emulate what people are really thinking about the world. Again, going against this, what's the general strategy that one size fits all, and really say, no, one size does not fit all. We need different sizes for different groups. So we, look, we use a lot of data, primarily from blogs, so millions and millions of words. And then we train a neural network. So neural networks, what's currently used these days to create word representation, and we did a very similar model to what was used before, with one exception. We now said, we know who said this word. We know that there was somebody from India or from US, or somebody from a male or a female. And so we actually attached that label, saying we know who's behind this, this word. And we did the same for the word that we are targeting as well for the words in their context. And when training this network, what we end up with is a vector, like a representation for that word. But now, instead of having just one representation that presumably would fit every single person out there in terms of how they see that particular word or how they interpret it, we have different, inter different vectors or different word representations for different groups. So with the data that we have, we compare how would a generic model do, which again, it's fairly sophisticated. It's based on these neural networks trying to train on very large data. But it turns out that if you actually account like who's behind the language, you can do better. And that, we saw that for gender and for culture. And in more recent work, we saw that if we increase the amount of data that we have, we can actually do even better. So it's, it's a lot of improvement just coming from this fact that we account for who's behind the language. So the main message here really is that data disaggregation is critical for equitable models. We cannot assume that that question answering system out there would solve everyone's problem. It turns out people from Detroit cannot use that. And it turns out we will need to think of how to create a model or a system that actually works for that particular community. And the same goes across many other communities. So now I want to go get to the last part of my talk. Um, 
I try to illustrate on why I believe it's very important who is that we are target, who are addressing or who is that we are impacting um, to our research. So actually working on research that has positive impacts on society. And also putting people at the center of that research, do not assuming, not assuming that we can build the same technology for everyone. It turns out if we do that, we will really benefit the majority and will not benefit the majority. Now, the other final argument that I want to make here is that it really matters who's doing that research. So that's the by people part. And these are efforts that I've been having really the, the pleasure and joy of being uh, a part of and were mentioned previously in the uh, generous introduction that uh, Michael made and Joyce um, and Laura made in their, in their comments. Um, with this belief that it really matters who's doing the research. In my role of president of the Association for Computational Linguistics, aside from starting a new position for diversity and equity and a new committee on ethics for NLP, I've also been working on this ACL year-round mentorship together with people also in this room, Ashkan Kazemi, one of my um, students, Jijing Jin, again, another student, um, and also other collaborators from other institutions, we opened this mentorship, which has received huge response. We have close to 1,000 respondents, students from around the world who sign up to receive this mentorship. And this number is really telling us how needed this kind of mentorship is. Another thing that I guess we all observe here, in uh, being where we are, is that really in the United States we are very privileged. We have a lot of resources, uh, we have a reward structure. See this very event, I'm rewarded for what I've been doing so far. Uh, but that turns out not to be the case in actually most countries around the world. And so trying to pay it forward and inspired by the presidential award for scientists and engineers that I received years ago from President Obama, um, I started together with collaborators, a similar initiative in Romania, and that has been very rewarding. It's really about how you can inspire others to do research. And this is a word for young researchers in science and engineer. In Romania, as in many other countries, they don't really receive much for the research they do, much appreciation. It's mostly sort of the salary they will get, but that's about it. And so getting that kind of recognition for the work they do, it really makes a difference. So those are, I would say, little things that can make a difference in terms of building a diverse a group of researchers who work on these kind of big problems, whether it's natural language processing or something else. There are also things that I've been trying to contribute here at Michigan um, after I I moved here um, in 2013, um, and these were mentioned already, for instance, the Discover Computer Science class that Laura Burdick and I have started with the goal of encouraging diversity. It's a class that's open to everyone, but it's particularly emphasizing the importance that diversity plays in computing, or explore computer science research, which we've been doing for three years. Now it's the fourth year. Um, the Diversity in Computing seminar series, and also, this new project we have um, for renewing CS, um, recruitment and retention of women in computer science, along again with wonderful collaborators who are really working tirelessly to make sure that we have a diverse group of people who now are educated in computer science and eventually will do the research, will build that, those technologies of the future. And without taking any sort of credit for that, Back in the day, when Janice was a faculty member, she was the first woman, so there weren't really any faculty aside from herself. There were very few women students. When I joined in 2014, uh, among students, there were about 17%, um, and now we are at 23%, which is not a big number in absolute, but it's really the, the threat. And again, I'm, it's not for putting it next to things that I've been involved with. It sounds like I'm taking credit for it. Absolutely not. I think it's every single thing that's happening that actually makes a difference, like everyone in this room making those kind of contributions. And now I'm at a point where I, can, I want to shift toward people who do natural language processing, so it's really by people, uh, but also people whom I'm particularly grateful 
um, for having them part of my life and my career. So these are the people in my um, research group. I think I have the most wonderful, amazing research group. Several of them are here. Um, these are all super smart, super hardworking, very collaborative students working on projects that are making a difference in, in the world. And themselves are paying it forward. Even if that's not necessarily something that's expected of them at this point in time, many of them are mentoring other students. Many of them are involved in initiatives that are making a difference for others around them. I'm also proud, I have to say, that I try to lead by example. I think I have a truly diverse research group. Um, so we, we have a, a wonderful environment and wonderful group meetings because of those diverse points of view that are always brought to the table. I'm also thankful, thankful for the alumni um, who are, went on to do wonderful things, um, each in their own way. You've already heard from, from Laura. Uh, she's here, a teaching faculty. Others went on to other um, places, other directions. Um, and I'm super proud of everything they've done. And most importantly, I'm very proud that they continue to be um, amazing human beings. Not necessarily NLP, NLP plus. Um, there is one group that I'm particularly fond of, and that's the, the AI lab. Um, I really appreciate every single individual faculty and staff and students alike in the computer science department. Uh, but I feel the AI lab has been particularly, I perceive it particularly as an academic home um, in terms of being very encouraging towards things that I, I was hoping to achieve and really uh, very supportive uh, since, the, since the very beginning. So I'm thankful to everyone um, for, uh, for their support. Of course, there is all the collaborators, too many to list. Um, I try to do justice and I'm sure I miss, I miss many. I think the one thing here is that there is, as one former student said, um, I really thrive in interdisciplinary spaces. I love working with people from, obviously from within my discipline, but from across disciplines. And these are just some examples of um, other departments um, with whom I've been working with. Um, and here on this list, I would also mention all the wonderful staff that we have, some of whom are here today and have how to put together this event, and in general, just supporting the work we do on a daily basis. I also want to thank specifically to the role models, and in particular, I want to highlight Professor Janet Jenkins today. I'm, I'm extremely happy to have had the opportunity to meet her today, and I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm inspired every day by everything she has done. So here is Janice. Um, some years ago with one of like, some of the equipment that I learned today. She was carrying it around. She travels with equipment around the world. Um, and she was, as was mentioned um, multiple times, she was the, the first woman in X. And interestingly, that maybe also posed some challenges. It turned out that people were trying to help her, um, but they figured out that she really, really, Janice really wanted to carry her own oscilloscope. Um, he would let other maybe open the door if it was Barbara, uh, but otherwise they figured she really wanted that independence. Um, and that, I think, speaks a lot about what it means to be the first in a, in a group, right? And Janice, uh, Janice was that, that person. She was very dedicated to students. Um, she is here in one of the classes that she taught, the digital design class, surrounded by her students. Um, in a news article I read about Janice, uh, she's quoting saying, life is good and the students are the best. Um, and she also said, apparently, um, that it's been wonderful and inspiring second career, like having a bunch of kids again. As you know, Janice joined the computer science department after having raised five children. So the comparison was quite appropriate, having a bunch of kids again, except they are brilliant students. Don't sass you, always take your advice, look up to you, and best of all, I don't have to pay their car insurance. <laughs> so that's the wittiness that many today have remembered from um, Jenny's time here. She was also during a time when 
there are very few women, and Janice was very encouraging toward women. She graduated several PhD students, female PhD students. Um, she was awarded the Sarah Goddard Power Award for Outstanding Professional Achievements and Contribution to the Education of Women. Um, and she also received an NSF Faculty Award for Women in Science and Engineering. Now I also want to thank my family and friends um, who are here today. Um, this is a recent picture with Mihai, Zara, and Kaius on the left. Those are um, that's my my family, and then my close friends who are here: um, Alina and Isabel and Galus and and Edo. I'm very grateful to them for um, being there for me and just providing the kind of emotional support that everyone would, would need as, um, as they go through. And last but not least, um, my foundation, and that's my family um, back home. They're not necessarily back home. They're spread all over the world. I have two siblings, um, my brother and my sister, um, with whom, to whom I'm, I'm really grateful for the times that we spend and continue to, to spend together and the extremely close relationship that we have and um, my mother and, and father, um, who have been contributing to everything that I am today. Uh, those of you who know me know I'm from Romania. Those of you who know me well know that I grew up during one of the darkest times in Romania's history. I was the communism when there was no food to put on the table, hours and hours without energy, no books, no this, no that, and yet my family they raise us in a way that made us appreciate education, really be happy for who you are and just having each other. So they really achieved a lot during those very difficult times to raise, um, to raise children who they each went on their way and being happy the way I am um, here today. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, my main message really, there is a close connection between natural language processing and people in many different ways. It really matters that we think about the impact our research has. It really matters that we put people at the center of the research that we do. And it really matters who's doing that research and pay attention who are the researchers, like what are the by people a part of that. And thank you for your attention.